Okay, so uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you to everybody who joined in. This is our second run talks, um, our second virtual run talks. I guess technically it's our fourth. Uh, the first two were at Big Rock Brewery, which was um, probably the preferred way of, uh, <laughs> of meeting, but this will have to do for the time being. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say welcome to everybody. Uh, we're still kind of learning as we go. So everybody who's coming in, I'll just kind of give you a heads up. When you come into the room, um, you are on mute and you can definitely go over to use the chat function to ask any questions you may like. You can also DM me directly if you want to ask, if you want me to ask a question for you. Um, and some of you, when you come in to ask a question, I might even just ask you if I want to, if I can put you guys in the hot seat and let you guys, um, put you on video and let you guys ask the question. But, uh, yeah. So for today we've got Tasha Wodak, um, Tyson Pesek and Blaine Penny joining us. I'm going to, if you guys would like to follow them on Instagram, what I'm going to do right now is just throw their Instagram handles into the chat. There we go. And uh, yeah, so first of all, I just want to say uh, thanks everybody for joining us again. Uh, we'll, this will all be on YouTube as well in case you miss anything or if there's anything that you want to uh, us to circle back on and I'll give everybody a really quick update uh, in, on things in terms of community. One of the questions that we receive the most often is can we still run outside and yes we can still run outside in Calgary but we are definitely uh, encouraged to maintain that at least a physical distance of two meters um, and as a runner one of the things that I've been hearing from a lot of coaches is that you want to try and kind of keep your efforts in zone two. This uh, especially now that it's getting very, very cold in Calgary and there's a pandemic, it's probably not the time to start hitting the VO2 max intervals and uh, have your hardest workouts of the season just yet. Last week we had Trevor Hoffbauer on and even Trevor was saying that he's kind of taking a little bit easier. So if Trevor can take it easy, uh, we can all kind of dial back on the intensity just a little bit. So um, first of all, I'm just going to say welcome again to our panel and I'll just kind of do a little round table and let you guys say hi and introduce yourselves and maybe uh, to get, uh, to get things started, you can let us know like what you got up to this weekend and Tash, since you're on like the top corner of my screen, I'll start with you. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I'm Tash Wodak. I'm a elite, uh, distance runner. 10,000 meters is my specialty. Uh, I have the Canadian record in that and I set the, the record in the half marathon this year and it lasted for all of 13 days before it got broken by Andrea Sagafian. But still, I ran under 70 in January. And um, yeah, you know what? Things were, the season was going well and I was supposed to go to New York to run the half and it got, you know, it was kind of like Thursday, March 10th, I think, or March 11th was when like everything started to get canceled and shut down. and. It was like two days before I was supposed to go to New York and everything then got canceled. So now I'm just sort of, um, I think what Trevor said is, you know, like less intensity, still running, but if I don't feel like running hard, I won't. And I'm just sort of running every day, taking a day off, doing, you know, how I feel. And, you know, it's tough times. So some days I feel not very motivated. So I just jog really easy and I think, I, I don't know if any of you caught my Instagram live last week and I just talked about like um, sort of running for the sake of enjoying it and the freedom it gives you instead of it being part of a training plan and now using it as a way when you're leaving your house it's probably the only time besides getting groceries that people are going out so really take that time to enjoy what you're doing so I've been trying to, to do that so anyways that's me and I'm here in Vancouver and so yeah. <laughs> yeah, and obviously it's much nicer in Vancouver. There's there's an incentive for you to go outside now versus us in Calgary. Yeah, we had like that first week where we were supposed to be, well, social distancing supposed to be, it was like 12 degrees and sunny and people just were not listening. So um, there's still a lot of people running in groups and things like that. So now it started, it started to rain. So people are doing a much better job. Well, that's good to hear. Um, Tyson, what about you? You were, you were also supposed to be in Flagstaff right now, or, or were you? Uh, so mid, so I think Easter Sunday, I was supposed to fly down to go work with the athletes kind of distance, a lot of the distance runners, but yeah, that camp got canceled. So yeah, just in Calgary, um, and about uh, up until March 18th, uh, I was working at the uh, physiotherapy clinic that I co-owned with Louise Taylor. Um, so yes, 
up till that point, we were kind of rolling along, kind of monitoring the situation. But when things started to escalate, we thought we better close our doors just to try not to kind of contribute to some of the spread with most of our treatments hands on, a lot of manual therapy, muscle release, dry needling. So, yeah, having to be like having to adapt and be agile like the rest of us here. For sure. Yeah. And, and now using telehealth appointments. So, kind of touching base with our patients that way. Cool. Cool. And we're definitely uh, going to talk about that a little bit more because I know we got a lot of questions uh, lined up for you here coming at you soon. So, sure. um, Blaine, how about you? I, I think uh, for everybody, Blaine and I seem to have the same sweat schedules because we'll always just see each other on the pathways or on Memorial Drive. So I've seen Blaine possibly more than I've seen anybody else uh, through the past couple of weeks. So Blaine, uh, how are things going for you these days? Yeah, they're going pretty well. It's uh, it's been an interesting time, of course. Uh, we were supposed to have been um, it was March break last week, so we were initially supposed to have been in in Maui celebrating uh, some downtime there. But obviously, the world has changed so much. But one of the the silver linings with that was uh, it was my son's birthday yesterday, and he turned sixteen, uh, and we would have been away sadly, and and missed that. So the one of the silver linings is we got to celebrate that with Evan. And for those of you that don't know me, uh, my son Evan. Uh, is severely impacted by mitochondrial disease and uh, he lives um, it's a pretty challenging life and and we never quite know how many birthdays he is going to celebrate so everyone is a gift to us so that was that was a real treat yesterday and that's where I saw Raf actually we're out walking Evan uh, down a memorial where they had closed they had closed memorial drive to actually create some extra space for people to get out and be be social and stretch their legs so that was kind of cool but yeah aside from that um, uh, uh, unlike Natasha, I, I'm well past my prime as an athlete. So uh, chasing old man uh, master's records is as close as I can get to performance these days. Uh, but was training for the the, the London Marathon uh, coming up in about a month. So um, since that had been canceled, looking for different ways to stay motivated and connected to the running group now that uh, you know we're kind of running solo, I had to be very careful given that Evan is vulnerable uh, about you know, who I interact with and, uh, and keeping that, that physical distancing. So it's been again, kind of rejigging sort of our, our personal lives. And then uh, not a huge change on the work front because I, I, I have been working from home for the last couple of years uh, for the work I've been doing with Mito Canada. So that hasn't been a huge shift. It's actually been nicer because Sarah has been working at home and so it's actually a little more social. I like that. <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah. Actually, one of the questions I was gonna gonna ask you was how's the balance? And it sounds like things balancing work and family and life are are I mean, I work from home as well, so it must be kind of a little bit kind of the same like business as usual in a sense. Yeah, it is for me, uh, for sure. So I'm, I'm, I'm well accustomed to this schedule. The, the big thing about working from home is, you know, or anybody would know that works from home is, is creating discipline around your hours, like when you're working, when you're not working, because it's so easy for that work to creep. Um, so one of the things I found is just kind of creating a bit of a schedule of, you know, when I'm enjoying my coffee in the morning and reading the news to now I'm working to, okay, now it's time to go for a run or, and now it's family time, that kind of thing. So it's, it's, it's important I find to be able to create those separations, but that's one of the big challenges. And then also, you know, teenage daughters in the basement, you know, texting saying, feed me, I'm hungry <laughs> <laughs> and having to bite my tongue. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, it's a lot on your plate there. So, um, so you probably saw like, I mean, London, or was probably one of the first uh, big races that kind of called it in. Was it a surprise to you? What was your reaction? Or you, did you kind of see it coming? Yeah, I, I felt it was coming. Um, certainly after Tokyo um, made the the changes that they did and 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 uh, and canceled every uh, all all the races except for the elites. So I just felt that as watching COVID ramp up, I, I just thought uh, you know you know also for us personally thinking about what what is safe. Uh, for us to travel, uh, the, the potential to get stranded somewhere and having Evan left here and, and his care, there's just so many things that could happen. So in the back of my mind, I was thinking, you know, uh, at a macro level, does it make sense for, for big crowds to get together? And that was before they announced any of those big changes. So I felt that things were kind of trending that way. And so really wasn't surprised. Um, and it's actually maybe a bit surprised it took him so long to announce it, to be honest. Yeah, well, I think even, um, I mean, I think, you know, Canada kind of took the lead with with the Olympics, and then we saw the next day uh, things pretty cha changed 
pretty quickly. But yeah, I think that's everyone sort of learning as we go along here. And these are certainly unprecedented times. So, um, you know, the Olympics only been postponed for basically world wars or the cold war. So uh, a lot of things happening, but there's, we, we talked earlier today and you've got something else really, really cool going on. Um, tell us a little bit about Novid 20. Yeah. So, you know, after the, the London marathon was canceled, uh, uh, the running group I run with called the Bow Valley Harriers. And we get, you know, mainly get together every Sunday for, for runs and, and beer paloozas. <laughs> uh, but you know, we're, we're saying, okay, you know, a lot of these races are going to be canceled now. How do we, you know, how do we stay motivated and fit? Uh, uh, and I was kind of threw out some silly ideas around, you know, trying to, you know, uh, you know, plan a marathon or, or something like that, that had some kind of funky points for whoever was, you know, could, could, you know, throw some Strava segments in and that kind of thing. So everybody's like, okay, let's, let's come up with some ideas. And then I was chatting with, uh, with my coach, Melissa Powie, who was on last week and Melissa's got a group of about 50 runners and she was saying, yeah, she wanted to be able to keep her, keep her, her, her group motivated. And, and a lot of them were like, Hey, I still want to put my fitness to the test. So, so we got this idea that kept evolving. And then we chatted with Kirsten from the Calgary marathon and it wasn't looking positive that, you know, the Calgary marathon was at risk of actually happening. And, and just the thought of a virtual event, and she's like, Hey, let's do something global. So, uh, so the idea of, uh, of, we came up with, it's called the Novid 20 virtual run. So the, the idea is, you know, COVID-19 is looking back when this whole, pandemic started. Novid 20 is kind of our optimistic view on the world that in 2020, uh, there's going to be no virus disease in 2020. So that's Novid 20. And really it's about engaging and uniting the Spartan and running community to, you know, to keep running, to come together, to do things like this, to be honest, and, but also to be motivated and challenged uh, to stay fit. And then thirdly, our, uh, we thought, hey, you want to throw it out there, optional. If people want to make a $20 donation, we'll raise funds, um, uh, to donate towards uh, COVID-19 research and, and work towards a vaccine. So yeah, so we just launched that this morning in 16 cities around the world. And I think we have over 100 runners signed up so far. So yeah, it's, it's an exciting initiative. Just again, just to keep people engaged, keep the conversation going, just something positive. That's super cool. And I think that's so important right now because, yeah, like we talked about last week, one of the biggest challenges is staying motivated, especially when so many of our race calendars are all, all of a sudden in this state of flux where, you know, if, you know, there's been nothing official around the Calgary Marathon, and, uh, but I think a lot of things are moving back and police, which is next month, has been uh, postponed already. So it's important for us to keep motivated. But question becomes quickly is is how so it's fantastic that you're doing that um and it exists on strava is uh is where it all is can you give us a quick rundown on kind of like how we should go register and i saw Haley. thank you for posting the link in the uh the chat there but if you can give us a quick rundown on that yeah that the easiest way to get all the information is is on our website that we've got set up so it's uh novid20.run and uh, you just click a button on there and there's three, three easy steps to, to register. So the first thing is what we've done is for each city, we've set up a, a Strava club. And then step two is for, for people once they join a Novid 20 Strava club in their city or location is to uh, sign up for a Strava April challenge. And that will automatically tally uh, all the different uh, participants uh, from, from each of the, the clubs in, in that challenge. And then thirdly, if people can, can register, sign up and make a donation through the, the GoFundMe uh, link that we've set up there. So it's just three easy steps, but yeah, mainly just leveraging the, the Strava platform and just kind of just, just logging your runs via the club and, uh, and engaging with the, with the rest of your group. Cool. And thanks again, Haley, for uh, sharing that second Strava club link. So if anybody wants to get more information, they can go to uh, go into the chat bar, go click on chat on the bottom of your screen. And Haley's been kind enough to post a couple uh, links for us there. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's all kind of virtual runs these days. When you go out for a run, is it just uh, just a leisurely run? Or are you out there chasing KOMs now these days and getting the miles in? Or how's, uh, how's your training program look? I mean, with, with London kind of pushed back, are you just kind of going with the flow now? Well, you know, I, I've really enjoyed the structure of uh, of having a following a training plan because I find that if it's there, I'll follow it. And that's one of the things I love about uh, working with a coach. And Melissa has been great. I mean, I had that conversation. She's like, hey, now that London's, do you just want to just do your own thing? I'm like, no, yeah, I've been really enjoying, um, you know, staying fit. It feels good to stay fit. And I think it's part of that mental 
uh, mental well-being. It's just good to have, keep some of that structure. So in the back of my mind, I was thinking I wanted to challenge myself to put my fitness to the test at some point in the spring. And, and I think I'll, I'll still do it on the day of the London Marathon. And, and Melissa's working with, uh, we're, we're, we're working on an idea for, for uh, Mar or April 26th for a marathon here, uh, a virtual marathon to, to do that. So, but yeah, so for me, it's been, been great to stay, um, to stay motivated and to keep following a plan. And also London has been bumped back to uh, October, uh, October 4th. And it's also the first ever World Masters um, Championships as part of the, the Abbott um, World uh, Age Group Championships. So in the back of my mind, I, you know, I, I want to build good fitness and, uh, and, and be ready to peak, hopefully, uh, in October if that happens. Cool. Cool. Fantastic. Um, well, we'll be, we'll be keeping an eye out for more info on that, uh, that virtual marathon of you there. Yep. Well, a shout out to Natasha. We, we do have a Van Vancouver uh, uh, club set up there. So uh, yeah, check that out on, on Strava and uh, yeah, it'd be great if you can help share that. For sure. Yeah. I was just, I was just pulling up Strava trying to, to see some stuff. So yeah, yeah, there's people all over Vancouver just going after segments and racing each other it's entertaining <laughs> yeah so well tash how how have things been out there like i mean like uh we started with blaine just how how is kind of adjusting to this new normal that we have here um i think like probably most of you um the first week races started to get canceled but it was kind of like just you know the next month of races so i was still holding on to hope that um you know there'd still be the races in may and in june so i was still training pretty hard and then when I found out, you know, basically we couldn't fly anywhere and every race on my schedule was canceled until the end of May, um, I knew then that the Olympics was just a matter of time. So I really sort of just settled down on my training and uh, ran, you know, mostly fartleks, uh, things like that. And I just, you know, I, um, I just felt sad. I felt sad for everything that was going on. And as an extrovert, I am used to being out and about and I'm very social and it's been difficult to be in here and not even to be able to run with people has also been really hard because I'm constantly meeting people in Vancouver to run with. Um, Dana Pitorowski and Catherine Watkins. I'm not sure if you guys know who Catherine Watkins is. She's a master's runner and she's awesome. She's run like a 116 half and she's 45. She's great. Anyways, um, well, maybe not 45 anymore. I think she's 48 now, but <laughs> I, used, I used to meet them at least two or three times a week and it would be like, you know, I'm sure you guys miss running with your friends. Like, it's just so great. So I really miss that. And I'm gonna, I think, kill my boyfriend because I'm making him run with me all the time. <laughs> He's not used to it, so. <laughs> Yeah, um, but when I found out the Olympics was postponed last week, um, <clears throat> I just cried. And then I was like, okay, now what? And I didn't really know what to do. So I took two days off and then talked to my coach. And she said, let's just do a workout every three to four days, like a fartlek, just so that you're keeping up that you know, you're not letting the intensity go completely and you've got something on your schedule. And, but, you know, I'm sure like everyone here who's a runner and all your races have been canceled. That's kind of like we, as runners, we live for racing. We, I do, I live for racing. I love training. I love the goals. And when that's all wiped away, it is difficult to keep the motivation, but I'm running now because I love it. And I love getting out the door and running in the forest and I love the feeling of a workout so when I do feel like working out you know I I enjoy the feeling after but uh, there's been some days where the motivation has just been gone so yeah well that was actually it was interesting one of the questions that I kind of kept pop, kept popping up with you uh with you was how do you stay motivated and I think you kind of you kind of hit the nail on the head there and, and it's um kind of changing the perspective because when we all go like this is this is kind of prime race season for all of us and we have to pivot from um pivot from you know looking six weeks or or a month down the road to that goal race and changing your workouts and that goes away it's it's like okay well now what 
would you say that, um, you know, in terms of like your periodization and, and kind of like the path to fitness, are you kind of just like in this maintain mode now, or are you kind of just going to like, going to take it a little bit easier and then start building again as the race calendar becomes clear once again, or what's that look like now? Honestly, like we're not sure it's been tough because every day it seemed, you know, like over the last almost three weeks, I guess now it's sort of been changing and more things have been canceled. And so we were holding on to hope that, you know, eventually there'd be a race, but now I'm just sort of maintaining, like you said, we took a really easy week and now I'm sort of just maintaining for my sanity and be, <laughs> um, because I love running and obviously like, um, when we do, you know, the, the truth is that I need to stay somewhat fit. I can't just go and quarantine, gain the quarantine 15. Like, let's keep it real here. Like I need to be ready so that when things start ramping up again, I haven't just sat on my ass for a month, you know? So, um, and I love to sweat. I'm doing lots of online classes. There's so many out there. It's so much fun. There's like this dance class I want to try tomorrow. So, um, there's so many ways to keep moving and keep, uh, motivated. Um, also doing classes with my friends who aren't runners and just doing regular strength classes with my friends has been, it's been fun to connect, I guess. So, um, yeah, you know, keeping them, you know, one, I, my main goal per day is a minimum of one hour of activity, uh, more for two. So one hour of cardio, one hour of strength, or two hours, like a, uh, we got an elliptical, Nice. Like, <laughs> it arrived like two days after everything ended and I was like this is the best thing ever because I cross train three to four times a week always so I was really like okay what am I supposed to do if you know so it's nice to have that and if for any reason we get into complete lockdown I still have the option of the elliptical but I mean I think like I said like I don't know how many of you guys out, out there are doing any of these online classes there's so many things to do you could be you could do like five classes a day and probably come out of this quarantine in the best shape of your life like woo. <laughs> yeah. well i uh one thing that i read and it's a little bit tongue-in-cheek but uh there was a meme going around that was saying by the end of this half of us are going to come out like fitter than ever and know how to cook and everything is going to be amazing and the other us will have been having no shower happy hours every day all day so there's no in between so it, it's good that we're all kind of focusing on staying fit here yes i think most of the prob most of the runners that i've been talking to are um sort of still running and and doing their stuff less intensity like you know like trevor was saying less intensity um and lots of people are really getting into cooking and baking um and i think that's a that's one thing I'm enjoying is this is such a big thing, nutrition. And it's one of my, one of my weaknesses is that I've always wanted to cook more and healthier. So I'm doing that. Um, I don't know if the baking is helping. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was just saying I baked banana bars with chocolate chips. They're very good, but yeah, there's that quarantine 15, I guess. Oh, uh, whatever. I did my two hours of activity this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so I got a couple, we did get a couple questions when we did the, uh, we opened it up to questions over the weekend on our YYC Run Crew feed. Um, and I've got one here. I'm actually just going to queue them up. Jeff Shikazi. Jeff, I'm going to put you off of mute and go ahead. Oh, now I have three, but I'll just use the one. Well, yeah, let's start with one and we'll, we'll, we'll get the other ones going too. Um, actually, I switched my question. So do you have a couple like key workouts, like, especially like you said, like we're probably all panicking a little bit, like either our fitness is getting worse or, or just in general, when you come off like a big training block and you take some time off, do you have like a couple of key workouts to either one, and that might be different one, build confidence to get it back or, or, and, or two, like a good test, like, I don't know, mile repeats or kilometer repeats where you're like, if I hit these paces based on my history, like this is. I don't have to panic as much as I am. Does that make sense? Obviously that's for Natasha. Um, okay, yeah. So <laughs> I would say don't do any measured um, intervals until you're like, you're sure that you're gonna, you're fit. Um, I actually don't almost ever go onto the track until it's track season or do, I do so many Bartlicks. So 
Um, cause you don't want to discourage yourself if you're not thinking, okay, I mean, if you don't go into it thinking I'm really fit, then you're just going to discourage yourself by looking at like, maybe eight by a K that you did before. But for me, um, if I'm ready and I want like that benchmark session, eight by a K off two minutes is my benchmark session or five by a mile off two minutes. And if I can do those in specific times, I know I'm in, you know, 31, 30 shape or or 32 minute shape and same with the half like I ran um we waited until about two weeks before um the the Houston half to do my really big key workout um I only really had three really big key interval sessions before um Houston every 10 days um so that was like three by 3k um five by 2k all at just a little bit faster than my pace and I was able to hit my target pace. So I was kind of like, okay, if I can do that. Um, yeah. But I think a lot of people, the eight by a K is a very popular measure of, of fitness. Um, and the five by a mile as well. Those are my, my favorite benchmark sessions. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. And if you, and I have so many fart licks that I do all the time that are, that will help you, sort of get ready for those big key track sessions. Lynn, my coach is a huge fan of the fartlicks. So um, they get you really fit. They're very tricky in how fit they get you. And without really having to go to the track, like if you're coming like out of quarantine and you just go to the track and you, you do like, you know, eight by 800 and you're so far off where you were before, you're just gonna feel like shit. But if you go and do a fartlick, and you're just kind of timing it. You're like, well, that felt good. And you don't know if it really wasn't that good, but you feel confident. So I think fart looks are really important, especially now. Yeah, that's such a really good way to frame it because I think even for myself, like kind of echoing what you said there, Jeff, sometimes I'll go into a workout and then whether it's on the bike or on the run, if I'm not hitting that specific number for that specific time, it can be really discouraging versus like if you're doing fart legs or just like a more variable exercise, it's a little bit easier to just come out of it feeling like, okay, I got a really good sweat in. That was good. And it's a good confidence builder. Mm -hmm. Especially with the weather for you guys, I think if it's colder or whatever, like it's all about effort. So if your effort is still really high and you may be way off your time, it's just, you're still putting the work in, you're putting the effort in. So I always say, don't worry so much about the time and good yeah um and i just got a, a quick message uh a dm actually somebody's asking um what's a fart lick so tash can you kind of <laughs> down for us there i think we went into full runner mode there for a second sorry uh fart lick is change of pace um so by minutes usually um so my we call it bread and butter so for example it'll be 20 minute warm-up directly into the workout so three minutes two minutes one minutes so you would, and I would do four sets of that. So one minute easy in between the three minute, two minute, one minute, three minute easy between sets. And you just continue to do that. So you never stop. So you're running hard, easy, hard, easy, hard, easy. And you can mix all those up. I mean, I have some really big ones, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, and then sort of back down. I don't think that much, but you get the idea. Yeah. Where like one, usually one minute easy between, and you can put in a set break. Um, so uh, that's the difference between, I guess, a far look and an interval session would be, you know, like there's no distance and there's no stopping. There's no actual stop breaks. So cool. Um, now, another question that I got from me for you uh, from the Instagram was, uh, does it <laughs> not that any of us will be traveling and changing altitude in the next little while? Um, but how does altitude affect your training or do you kind of have that in mind or when you go to a lower, when you go to a higher altitude and then come back down, is it kind of a bonus or how does that kind of change things for you? Well, we're still sort of, you know, figuring that out because I, I went to altitude twice last year, uh, and had two different results. So, <laughs> um, I went to Flagstaff last spring and Tyson was there and it was great. I had a good camp, although I did strain my calf. Um, and again, thank you, Tyson, for fixing me. <laughs> I strained my calf like two weeks out. It was very stressful, but I ended up going to Peyton Jordan and running really well. I went directly from four weeks of altitude 
to Flagstaff and race the very next day. So I ran within that 48 hour window. So I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with how altitude training works is you either go and race within 48 hours, they say, of coming down, or you, you don't race between two and seven days, and then you race after that. They don't want you to race in that sort of five to seven day window after that, or so, or so the science says. So the second time I went to altitude, I went to St. Moritz this summer, and then I went to Spain and had that week off um, down and then raced on like the 10th day or something like that. And if any of you follow my running career, Doha was not my best race. But whether or not that had to do with the effect of altitude, I don't know. I think it was just a really long freaking season and I was exhausted. So it could have been that. But um, training at altitude is, uh, it, I find it difficult because you can't hit those benchmark sessions that we were talking about, right? And I usually want to go and do eight by K and I want to run it in three minutes. And if I don't, I panic. And you can't do that at altitude. So you have to adjust. And even if you go down to like, you know, 4,000 feet versus 7,000, it's still an adjustment. So I had a, you know, I had a hard time thinking that what I was doing was still good enough. So I think mentally you have to be prepared for that as well. And so I'm still learning, um, a, you know, about training at altitude and, I have had this debate a few times is, is there more of a benefit of training at altitude? So getting that, you know, they say you can have up to 8% um, increase in performance from high altitude training, but some people have almost zero um, versus the quality of life. So for me, I love being home. I love being where my own physio massage therapist boyfriend, home, family, Sam cat. So I, I try to weigh the benefits of your happiness versus your training. And so that's why I usually only do one altitude training camp or one camp pretty much a year um, because I'm happiest when I'm home and I train best when I'm home. So my plan for the Olympics was actually to stay home up until the very last minute and then fly into Japan. Cool. Well, that, that, Thanks for answering that question. That was that was a good explanation because I think at, in in Calgary we all assume that we have this huge advantage because we're like thirteen hundred feet above sea level. So it's good to kind of consider that and have that in the back of our minds as well. Um, if anybody else has any questions for Tash, feel free to uh, shoot into the DMs. In the meantime, I've got uh, one more question at least for you, and this one comes from Sarah Hingliss, and her question was. When will you and Alan be getting married? <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, well, I ask him all the time. So, <laughs> yeah, oh, I don't know. You know, um, we're very happy here. So one day, one day. Well, one day. Don't worry, it'll be all over the Instagram when I am. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for answering that one. <laughs> um, so the next question, this one, it came in from a few different people and it's kind of actually for you and for Tyson. And then we might actually segue and asking you a few more questions, Tyson as well. But, um, Tash, I'll let you start, but this one had to do more with strength. Um, like what do you do? I'll make it two parts. Uh, one is, and you kind of already answered it, but how much strength training do you do, uh, in run training and, um, what are kind of your favorite strength training exercises for running that you'd recommend for others uh i get asked this question so often um it's crazy and i keep saying i'm going to post a little video online of some of the things that i do so maybe i will but um so many runners right now elite runners are posting their little um home strength training um videos it's I'm very fortunate we have a little gym downstairs and I'm able to do most things that I would normally do at the gym. Um, and I work with a strength coach I have for the last five years. So um, my, and my strength coach now works directly with my physio, which is very helpful. I think Tyson will maybe pipe in on that is sometimes there's a disconnect between um, your physio and your strength coach and some of the movements you may be doing in your strength are not are kind of going against what you're doing with your physio so I'm, i i've got those two coordinated now which is really helpful so when mary lou gives me exercises to do and we're working on my weaknesses i can go to my strength trainer and he's already spoken to her directly 
and I'm doing specific movements to help um, get me stronger and less injured. So um, my program is uh, very specific to my problems and my needs. And so I do a lot of rotation things, a lot of movement in here, because I tend to be, I don't know if you guys can see me, I tend to do this when I'm tired. So over the last few years, we really worked to get me like this. So when you're running, you're like this, not. So um, we've done a lot of work like that. And obviously like tons of glute work. I do lots of glute strength. Um, Tyson gave me some great exercises last year um, and lots of core. Um, and, but I don't, you know, I don't do, I do very little weights to be honest. Um, I have a few dumbbells downstairs that I use, but resistance bands are great too. And you can go and buy the ones that go behind your door. Those are great. And there's so many exercises you can do with those. So, and I would say that I do strength training two to three times a week. Um, now that I'm in like, you know, lockdown, I would say like five days a week. So I'm sore all the time, but I'm having fun. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Tyson, how about you? Uh, strength for runners. What's like, maybe I'll frame it. What do you think we need to work on the most as runners? For sure, I'd say, yes, strength's critical um, for all runners. I find too many runners just run. Uh, real critical that they have a strength component. Um, and just to echo what Natasha said, I think it's critical to have a team approach, even though running is an individual sport, whether it's um, working with the run coach, the strength coach, like Natasha said. So with Calgary, a couple of our elite runners here, Jessica O'Connell and uh, Maria Bernard, um, I work really closely with their coach. Uh, we'll have meetings and also with their strength coach to try to all be on the same page. So we all in same communication. So <clears throat> really critical, again, even though it's an individual sport, you can't have that team environment. And then <clears throat> with regards to some of the key components for runners, so definitely like Natasha said, glutes are critical. Um, running can be three to three to five times your body weight. So that's a lot of force that a runner is absorbing on one leg. So glutes play a big role. Um, some of the areas I find runners don't focus enough on is calves and feet, uh, in particular the soleus muscles. So I see a lot of people doing calf raises or eccentric heel drops, but it's really critical that you focus on the soleus muscle. And so that's going to be targeted and your knees bent because most runners are going to land in that position. And then you could have the strongest glutes in the world, but if your feet aren't strong, and also mobility is really important as well through the feet, uh, a lot of runners will end up with kind of compressed or jammed feet and ankles. If I kind of touch a little bit when the first time I met Natasha was right after her, her calf strain and flag stuff last year. I and, saved my life. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and one of the things I, I love, so I, I played hockey 18 years, and as soon as I stopped playing hockey, I didn't have that competitive environment. So as I transitioned to a physio, I could work with athletes. And Natasha had this day, so we really wanted to make sure she could run the Peyton Jordan meet, a uh, really important meet for her qualifying for Worlds. So we really had to be efficient, we had to be safe, but um, those situations I get excited about. I don't want to ever see a runner get hurt, but it was uh, a great kind of challenge to try to kind of work with her to get her back so she could run that race. Um, and someone like Natasha, one of, or basically Canada's fastest ever 10,000 meter runner. Um, when I tested her glutes, I could push her leg down pretty, pretty easily. And so even though she had been doing a lot of glute work, there was some compression tightness in her hip flexors. So, which she had been in Flagstaff, traveled to Vancouver, I think around a 10 K came back. Um, so there's that combination as well. Watch her run. Like she was mentioning, she was limiting her, her left rotation and it was her right calf. So there's many components to a running injury. We couldn't just let her calf heal and rest it or just strengthen her hips. Um, so I'd kind of work that multi-component, but even for her, we had kind of to go back to the basics with a lot of strength exercises. Uh, another big component I don't see as many people work is their hip flexors. So I find a lot of runners complain about real tight hip flexors where they've had a lot of stretch or a lot of needling, muscle release, but it comes down to they're more of a weakness we gotta target. So um, that's kind of one area I think runners could work more at is strengthen their hip flexors. Cool. Uh, yeah, actually I, I know um, 
for those of you who don't know, Tyson also basically saved my life in, in running. So I think all of us owe him a little debt of gratitude. Um, Tyson, one of the questions that uh, I think we've gotten a lot or that I, I got quite a bit um, in person, but you know, a lot of us, we, we can't see our, our physios, our chiros, our RMTs right now. So um, what kind of, what would you recommend if, if we can't go see that? I know you're doing some work um, by a video with some of your clients, but um, is there something that we could, this is one of the questions I just received as well. Is there something that we could be doing to help, you know, reduce injury or kind of uh, get ahead of potential injuries, recognizing that we can't just walk into a clinic and see you guys? For sure, that's a great question. And I've been getting a lot of messages with runners saying help. And uh, <laughs> unfortunately, you know, we can't really do any hands-on work. On uh, Two days ago, the Alberta government basically shut down all physiotherapy clinics. Uh, I mentioned at the start, we shut down on the 18th just to try not to contribute to the spread. But um, there's lots of stuff you can do from home. I always try to give patients, runners I work with, tools to manage some of their problems on their own. So I just grabbed one of these. I'm at my clinic. so. A lacrosse ball or a trigger point release ball can basically be your, your friend during this time, using it to roll some of those key spots, whether it's your feet, calves, hip flexors, um, to do a little bit of self-release as well, using rollers to get in those tissues. Um, a lot of the handheld massage guns are also getting pretty popular as well to kind of work some of those tools. Um, and then the key is, I've been trying to reach out to pretty much all of my patients runners to, to stay in touch with your therapist. So there's lots we can do. I, I do a lot of video analysis of runners. So runners are sending me videos and then we can meet to discuss it either online or on the phone. Um, so there's, there's many ways, uh, I had quite a few sessions the past week where we'll do a rolling session and then some activation or, or strength exercises with the runners um, as well. And, I was just going to say as, as well, a lot of people have extra time, so you can try to use that time to kind of get ahead, like you said, of some of these, these uh, overuse issues. I was very excited when I saw Natasha post on Instagram that she got elliptical. Uh, Jessica O'Connell also got elliptical too, So, because that's the problem. Is people have time, they might run a little bit more, or like Natasha says, she's killing her boyfriend by making him run probably more than he's capable right now. So we got to be conscious of that. Um, for me, as a 215 pound ex hockey player, even for me, I have a lot more time. So I, I went for a run on the weekend, about 30, 35 minutes, which, but I had more time and I was like, I should keep going. I feel okay, but um, my body, I haven't run that much lately. So we just got to be careful of volume and intensity um, in this time when we do have more time. So yeah. trying to focus a bit on either the classes, like Natasha said, or focusing on rolling uh, strength exercises. Yeah, I think uh, that that's pretty key because I think the first week of this, I was definitely loading on the the run and bike volume, just going all out. But kind of had to take it take it a little bit easy over the past few days. Um, so yeah, one of the questions that uh, another question that we had here was like, before we go out for a run, is there any activation exercises that you really like to see us runners doing just to kind of like, like I know that you and I went through like glute activations and stuff like that. Um, any like any key tips for when we, before we hit the pavement? Yeah, one of the big things is, so activation are good. I like runners to do a little bit of rolling mobility. Um, one of the things back in 2010, when I started working with the Canadian uh, bobsled and skeleton teams is we had these massive guys and girls and they could squat over 700 pounds. They're bench pressing 450. So just these muscle kind of power uh, uh, freaks of athletes and I would muscle test them and I could push their legs down pretty easy. So what we don't want is kind of these compressed hips and feet and calves. So Usually what I like to say before you do some of the, the glute work is do some rolling with the ball. Um, it's really important because you can do a million glute bridges, clamshells, but if, uh, if my hand is your hip, if it's just this compressed hip that doesn't move, then you're not going to be able to engage it and kind of have the mechanics to en engage the glute. So usually I'd recommend some rolling through the hip flexors, through the glute, uh, through the feet, the calves, and then doing some uh, activation, whether it's glute bridges, some banded exercises as well um, doing like some single leg squats with a band around your knees just because when we run we need all the muscles to work together 
So we never just use our glutes or calves. We want the muscles to work kind of in a rhythmic pattern. So similar to Natasha said, I also too have quite a bit of extra time. So I was thinking about maybe making an Instagram post on even kind of a, a pre-activation routine, um, either myself or I'll get maybe Jessica or Maria to, to do one yeah. for me as well. So, but yeah, yeah, really critical to prepare your body to handle the, the large forces of running versus just like a couple leg swings and then off you go. You got to get your body ready to, to handle the forces. So. I think that every single runner on here would love to see uh, to see that Instagram post. Um, Can I ask Tyson a question that yeah. has to do with that? Um, one thing that I I drive every run, and so some of the I don't have the option of basically sitting on the ground and doing those things. So, yeah. is there a point in doing the rolling at home and then driving half an hour and then doing these things? That's my question, because I'm sure some of you guys are, are driving to your runs as well. So um, if you can maybe help, that's my question. Am I allowed to ask him a question? Yeah, yeah, that's good. It's a great question. Yeah. yeah. How does that work? You know, I still do a lot of the glute stuff when I'm out of my car and, and activate that way. But, you know, when it's pouring rain, you don't really want to get down on the ground. So, yeah, I get that question a lot. Like, when should I do the exercises or like, what's the optimal time? And I would say you want to get it in whenever you can. So let's say right now you're gonna go for a run, you get in your car, you sit for a while, you get there, and let's say you've been sitting for an hour, most likely your hip flexors are in shortened position. So after this call, let's say you rolled for a while, got in your car, and then got to the, uh, the track or the, the trail, your hips are gonna be in a better position than, than when you started mm -hmm. a run. So yeah, I would say ideally it's best right before, if you had, if you're at the track, you can lay down, like if you had a mat, but yeah, what you wanna do is roll before you get in the car, Okay. And because uh, it's kind of like if you go on an eight hour flight, if you get on that flight, let's say you're going to compete in Europe. If you don't have um, kind of mobile hip flexors before you get on the flight, it's going to be much worse when you arrive in Europe. So I always tell athletes before a drive or a long kind of inactive period, we're going to have to sit. You want to have your hip flexors as mobile as possible. So, so yeah, if you do it at home, drive, do some activation, and then you should be good to go. Cool. I've got an, I've got a question as well. So uh, I, I felt fell into that camp of of ramping up and get a little overzealous on some mileage over the last couple of weeks, and and uh, felt my knee a little bit yesterday as I was finishing my long run. And sure enough, as I go out to hit, hit my run today, uh, my knee is 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 hurting. Yeah. Uh, I'm like I'm going to take a week off. I'm just curious. Maybe uh, I'm sure a lot of other runners have some you know, knee injuries, but what what are the most common knee injuries that that you see and uh, and what do you find is typically the, the root problem for most of those knee injuries and what you recommend? For sure. So yeah, knees are pretty much the most common running injury we'll see. Um, I'm just going to give a shout out to a fellow physio here. So I'm also trying to make myself a little bit smarter. So this is a Vancouver physiotherapist that Natasha's worked with in the past. Dr. Chris. And side note, he ran my very first and only marathon with me. Oh, excellent. And we trained together, Chris Napier. He's so awesome. Say if there's any therapists, I highly recommend this book. <laughs> or even runners in general. So there's some great descriptions, but yeah, basically in this book, they talk about all the different knee injuries. Um, and it's always key. If you have a, an area of pain, it's never where the injury is coming from. So you gotta determine where it's coming from. So just like Natasha's calf, it was coming from her foot, her ankle, her hip and her upper back. So even though we had to treat the calf, so, so yeah, knees are never just a knee issue. Um, and a lot of runners too will just say, okay, I'm sore, I'm gonna just take a week off. Um, it's kind of like if you're driving your car, I like to tell runners that your service light comes on. What you don't want to do is just keep driving your car till that light bulb or the burns out and you're like, oh, the, my problem's gone, the, the light's off. <laughs> so, and that's kind of like, just like if you rest it, there's always going to be a cause. So pretty much most of the injuries are caused by something in the foot and the ankle. And because the, the knee takes so much stress or up in the hip. So if you do like a single leg hop test, I use it with a lot of runners, you should be able to control that force. And often if the foot's jammed or the, the calf's compressed or you've got that compressed hip, you're not gonna be able to absorb the force, especially in your calves and your hips. So, um, so yeah, generally I would try to like do some rolling in your calves, your foot, uh, do some of the glute activation, um, working on that control of like single leg squats before you, you start hitting the pavement. And this is the thing too, is so many runners just say it's going to go away. And I always tell runners, 
let your therapist know sooner than later so you can get on it before it becomes a big issue. Yeah, that's uh, that's some a good piece of advice. I think too many of us are pretty guilty for like running into the point where we literally can't run anymore, and then we're like, I should see somebody about this. And by then, uh, sometimes you know we're you're taking more weeks off than we need to. So, um, sure. Jason, I got another question for you here. I'm gonna bring Sophie up, and then I got another question after that that's gonna be for all of you. So, sure. um, Sophie, go ahead. Um, this question is a little bit selfish because I am a brand new physiotherapist. So I was gonna ask if you have any advice for a physio starting their career and then to make it a bit less selfish, I guess a better question would be, how did you know you're in the right career and how did you kind of set and achieve your career goals? All right. Lots of good questions there. Um, so yeah, so back when I was playing hockey, um, I knew I couldn't play hockey forever. So I was looking for a career I could stay involved with athletes and sports. Um, so I was considering either sports medicine or physiotherapy and, I shadowed some some doctors and also some physios, and I found doctors, <clears throat> which are a very important part of the team. But a lot of times, what they're doing is is managing the issue. Where physios, we get to really work closely with the person, whether it's um, exercises, hands-on manual therapy, uh, dry needling. Um, and I found too, as soon as I stopped playing hockey, I had a real hard time not being able to again compete myself. So. Um, I love working with all populations, but especially the active population. Um, I kind of live and die with the athletes. So if we use Natasha's example, I remember watching a race online, just like crossing my fingers, hoping her calf would hold up. Um, so it's, it's kind of nice to be involved with the athletes and you see them quite a bit and develop close relationships. So, um, but as far as things to start out, so, uh, as as uh, physios often really competitive and want to take every course, but um, you really want to get good at assessment skills because that's kind of going to guide your treatment because it, treating the body, it's I always say it's the most tricky machine we're dealing with. There's lots of factors at play. So, and whether you're in a, a clinic and you only have about 30 minutes or an hour with the patient, you want to have your tri treatments as effective as possible as well. Um, you don't want to just give someone 12 exercises to do. You got to be really specific. So it's really important to have really strong assessment skills. Um, I was lucky early in my career to get to um, go to some Olympics world championships where other countries had really good therapists. So if you can connect with a mentor, um, they can teach you kind of shortcuts. So I was really lucky to have some mentors early on in my career to kind of push me along. Um, but yeah, and just, um, just getting your hands dirty, volunteering at different events. That's helped me a lot. Um, especially if you do want to work with runners, uh, volunteering at races with just different track clubs, because that's how we're going to learn. Um, kind of getting your hands working on people. So, Sophie, you can just uh, work on all of us at Run Crew. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, I was going to say, yeah, if you have questions after, um, yeah, try, I like to help out new physios and kind of pay back the profession a lot that helped me, me. So yeah, if you have questions or you want to chat or um, yeah, just let me know. Yeah. Cool. And so if I can connect you guys and make sure you can chat afterwards. Sure. Um, this one is kind of for all of you. Um, Jeff, go ahead. Uh, favorite recovery tools. Should I uh, forego a month of rent for Norma Tech boots? Do you guys use them? Do you believe in them? Um, and then like fascia scraping, like the sidekick. And then um, from Haley and I, beat doping. Do you do it? Is it worth it? Anything else? I don't know. Uh, do you want me to answer first? Sure. Uh, I do not have the Norma Tech boots. Um, I have been thinking of getting the Air Relax boots. I think they're like one third the cost. They're like 500 or 600 bucks and they're essentially the exact same thing I have tried them out so um, we were thinking of getting those but I, I don't know I use the Norma Tech boots when I was in Flagstaff I had access to them for a month and I didn't see any difference in my recovery so I don't know I don't have them um, I have the sidekick tool I have uh, the hypervolt gun I have all of the rolling equipment, so I kind of go between that. I do find the sidekick tool is really good for the calves. Um, I have really tight perineals, um, constantly running on the outside of my feet. So I find that that's a really easy, um, easy way to loosen my calves and, and work out the adhesion. So I really like the sidekick tool. Um, and the massage gun is, 
easy and it feels great and you can just massage yourself with it. So whether or not, I mean, I'm really, I don't know, is it a substitute for a massage therapist? No, but I think it's, it's a nice thing to have. So I do use those pretty much every few days. Um, so there's my, was there another, what was the final part of that question? The bead doping was the question. What, sorry? Bead doping. What's Jeff, that? do you want to explain that one? <laughs> <laughs> or just taking beats or beat shots for like increased oxygen, <laughs> I think. No, I think I only have beats if I put them in like a bowl and that's shredded. I don't really like them very much, so no. <laughs> <laughs> Wasting my money. <laughs> Then <laughs> you'll, uh, you'll have to ask Dr. Trent, the head physiologist for Athletics Canada. Okay. He would be, I'm sure he would have thoughts. He'd have the inside scoop on that. Yeah. Um, Tyson, what about you? Favorite tools for the runners for recovery? Yeah, a lot that Natasha, I'm a huge fan of. Um, I always say basically what we're doing when we're doing any treatments, whether it's hands-on treatment or using some of the modalities, whether it's rollers or the guns, is you're putting a stimulus into your nervous system. So even though I'm a huge fan of rolling, I wouldn't tell a runner to roll aggressively every, every day. We don't want to bruise tissue. We don't want to beat it up. So you're trying to get your nervous system. So I like a combination of uh, using the tools. So whether it's like the, trying to uh, target the fascial layer, so basically the covering of our muscles using some of the instrument of soft t assisted soft tissue mobilization like a sidekick can be really really effective just to keep that tissue quality high so um yeah pretty much on the same page as natasha i think having a, a variety um the other ones i might would bring up is uh like uh, either a contrast bath or even like a cold tub that can also be a way to re recover mixed research on that but um or, or, even, or even like um like an epsom salt bath so and and pretty much it's trying so i always tell runners like give it a try if it makes you feel better then then it's a tool for you because some people can't handle ice baths um uh, heather moist uh canadian olympic bobsledder she had really high tone in her fascia and an ice bath would just kind of ground her so she would have do uh like a warm bath like the day before her competitions and even in, in uh, Sochi, there wasn't baths. So we, the Canadian Olympic team got her a big garbage can and filled that with water. So she'd just stand in the garbage can. So, but yeah, using hydrotherapy can be a good tool for recovery. Cool. Uh, how are you, Blaine? What's uh, Yeah, what's I, I, I've become a huge fan of, of, the, of rolling, to be honest. Uh, and that's been my, my go-to stay for the last year or so. Um, and, and traditionally, I haven't been a, I haven't paid too much attention to the recovery part and, and that's resulted in, in injuries for sure. But I would say there's the two things, the before and the after. So I think uh, thinking of recovery before you even start is important. And I found like uh, the, the glute activator exercises have been, been really helpful for me. Uh, just strengthening, the, I, I think my, my hips are super tight. And so that rolling and also glute exercises and just getting in around the hips have been super helpful. And then and I think back to some of the the bigger, uh, events I've done like like Trans Rockies where you're doing back to back hard days so it's a it's a six day stage race where you're running about 20 miles a day I found like you know dipping the legs in in a cold river and just getting that that cold hydrotherapy is is really helpful it just seems to help take that inflammation down so as Tyson was saying as well as Natasha just I think a variety of those things and and just listen to your body to to get a sense of what feels good after and and how does your body respond to those different things Cool. Um, Tyson, or kind of all of you, or Tyson, how long would you rec recommend that people roll? Like is, is 20 minutes enough? Is five minutes enough? Do we need to do like an hour? Can we save it all up for like one hour and a half hell session a week? What do you recommend? Yeah, I find it's, it's kind of person dependent. And actually just before I was gonna answer, I was just gonna say another product. So I'll just hold this up. This is Jessica Connell's uh, Instagram. She posted, I think, yesterday the day before. It's called Zen Products. It's a product out of Norway. Um, it's like a, it's a automatic roller. So she just puts her legs on it. Um, so yeah, I kind of joked with her that I've been replaced by a machine officially. So, and she said, as long as it doesn't, if it once it starts needling her, then 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 I'm officially gone. But that's another that I hadn't heard about. Yeah, but uh, yeah, she just is starting to use that. 
while in mm. kind of the social distancing. Um, but yeah, back to your question. So I always tell people you want to kind of get that effect. So when I'm working on someone's, let's say, hip flexors, I'm looking to feel that muscle release or give way a little bit. So you should feel that kind of change in tissue. So generally, I'll say you want to work the tissue for about a minute to two minutes. But you want to physically kind of feel that, that tissue give way a little bit. Or if you're using a scraping tool, kind of same thing. You want to change that tissue. Um, and as well, depending on how much you're rolling, but usually I'll try to give someone like maybe a, a 10 to 12 minute rolling routine. Because I find if I give someone 20, 30 minutes to roll, they're probably not going to do that. And then they're not going to, it's not going to be effective. So, um, yeah, try not to overwhelm people with the amount of rolling, but kind of 10 to 12 minutes. Usually most people can fit in. Yeah. Well, we can especially fit it in now. I think there's no excuses for not doing our activations and our, and our rolling exercises at all. So, um, I got another question here from Ian Jeffrey, and this one was for, uh, for Blaine and Tash. Uh, Ian, you're off of mute. So if you want to go ahead. Okay, so for you, Natasha, is your coach local in Vancouver? Tasha, is your coach uh, in Vancouver as well? Is she frozen? Oh, I think she might be frozen. Am I frozen? <laughs> Hello? Sorry. Oh, okay, there you go. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, uh, my coach lives in White Rock. So that's, sorry, that's like 45 minutes from where I live in North Vancouver. Cool. Oh, Ian, you're on mute. Is that there. good now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, because you have specific workouts you do, correct? Yes. And so say if it's horrible weather outside, will your coach modify the workout to do it indoor or will you still go outside and do it? Uh, well, I live in Vancouver, so we don't really get snow. So... Oh, uh -oh. you're frozen again. <laughs> oh, there you go. Hi. We have you again. Hear me? Hear me? Uh, yeah. I was saying that we don't really have a lot of weather here that forces me indoors. I had two treadmill days this entire year. Um, and I just did my fart. I did a, my fart look on the treadmill. Um, there's been lots of days where it's been absolutely torrential rain. Like we had New Year's Eve day, we had 75 millimeters of rain in like 12 hours. So yeah, it's just like so much rain. And I had eight by a K to do at Beaver Lake. And I got out there and it was just like, Beaver Lake is this like, it's a loop, but it's a K and it's like soft packed trail, I guess. But it was just absolutely like pools of water. And so the session was modified in the way that we didn't care what my times were. It was just, we were keeping the effort high. So I've said that before is sometimes we throw the times out the window and just make it about effort and so and also that they're getting faster as I go along even if they start off really freaking slow um, you have to consider like oh it's super windy today so I'm not going to be running my fastest you have to accept those conditions and just be okay with knowing you're not going to run as fast but we don't ever change the workout like she won't cut it down um, ever if it's windy or if it's raining or anything like that um, unless it's it's an injury risk like snow or ice then we would definitely change it but here in Vancouver we don't really have those um, concerns okay and for you Blaine does would Mel alter your workouts or so, well sometimes we'll talk about it but usually um, like my, my preference is even like even when the conditions are terrible and it's icy out like I think of it okay, what, what are the worst conditions that could be like on race day? So I use those as days of like their, their mental training days, even, even though you're probably not going to hit those paces, but think like Natasha was saying, if, if you think about effort and if you can, you know, put out a strong effort on those days, whether it's windy, whether it's icy, whether it's snowy, I find uh, you're, you're building not just the physical strength and the physiological benefit of the workout, but also mentally, um, you know, on race day, it's going to be a lot easier. So so I tend to, I, and I think this is a, a very individual thing with, with an athlete. Some people do not handle ice or, or that, um, 
you know, it, you know, those variable conditions very well and will just opt to a treadmill. But for me personally, uh, I, I prefer, you know, just kind of going head on into it and just using it as a mental building exercise. Okay. I, I was just also going to add to that. Um, we had an Olympic prep series that the Canadian Olympic Committee put on right before the uh, Pyeongchang Olympics. And they had um, Ashton Eaton, so the American uh, decathlete. And he said he would time his workouts to the conditions when they were at its worst. So kind of like Blaine said, because if a competition came up and the weather was bad, he was going to be mentally and physically ready to handle those conditions. And he would like that challenge of those tough conditions. So, yeah, we kind of use it to kind of push his training, which is probably why he's two-time gold medalist in the decathlon. So, oh, that's um, that's a good like the mental side. I think training and racing or training here in Calgary, especially since it literally just started snowing a ton while we've been on this call. It's uh, it's good to remember if we ever go to California and it starts to snow, we know who's going to win the race. Um. <laughs> Tasha, I got a question for you here uh, from Rob Kelly. And his question was, um, was 2019 the best year of your career? If not, what was the best year? Oh, uh, wow. Uh, I wouldn't say it was the best year of my career because it ended on such a shitty note. I mean, I, I mean, Doha was probably one of, you know, you look at the race and the time was not that, not that bad but it was heartbreaking it was one of the races that i wish i could just erase from my career because it was mentally it rocked me so it's hard to to look at the rest of the year and say it was my best year ever because it it had that in it but every year you have something like that in it so i mean besides that i i think i had a very consistent year up until then and it was you know i won pan am gold which was my first international medal the age of 37 so i guess it was it was pretty cool but i mean i think maybe 2015 i would say was my best year because i think it was when i set the canadian record and qualified for the olympics so i mean you can't that was a, like a breakthrough moment for me so i'd have to maybe pick 2015 cool <laughs> Um, we got about seven minutes left here so if anybody has any final questions you can throw them in um one question that uh, I did get from Jesse Lumsden, and this one is for you, Tyson. Um, he told me to ask you about your, um, how many fights did you have in your career at Queens? <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jesse, for the, uh, the question. Um, so, yeah, I was going to say he, he was too busy basically smashing our Queens football team <laughs> when he played for McMaster to pay attention to university hockey, I guess. But... Yeah, in university hockey, uh, there's no fighting allowed in, uh, in university hockey. So, yeah, so the number is zero. But, but yeah, thank you for the question, Lummer. <laughs> so, I'll have to yeah. get back to Lummer on that one. Yeah. Um, and I see here, uh, if anybody has any, que uh, any questions or suggestions for online classes, I know that Tash and myself – um, feel free to DM us because we have a whole bunch that um, that we've been going to and I think that everybody probably has their favorite ones but the past couple of weeks I've been doing a few um, that Kate Mack and Justin Tan has been putting on which is combining yoga with the uh, lacrosse ball which is basically um, ruining yoga because now I'm associating with pain and the lacrosse ball but <laughs> it's, um, it's really good so um, yeah if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to throw it into the group chat. Otherwise, um, oh, I do have a question here. Yeah, can we do a class together? Yeah. <laughs> I've been thinking of doing an, an Instagram live of like a core and glute, like a 20 minute sort of, I just have to put it together. So if you guys cool. are interested in that, it would basically be my, I did my core and glute today. It took me exactly 20 minutes. So I usually try to do 10 minutes of glute and then 10 minutes of core basically no break, just boom, 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 boom. And then you're done. So I can show you guys um, those things. And you need a band though. Do you guys have bands? Got bands. I think, I think we've, uh, we've. Most slowly... brothers have a band, you know, the blue the band. You can make do something. Natasha, just, just to reinforce how we need that right now, look outside in Calgary. You can't, you can't. Yeah. 
You can run in the snow, can't you? <laughs> you know those things you put on your shoes? What are those called? Crampons? <laughs> <laughs> We've got our spikes, yeah. But yeah. All right, so. I got another one. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, these, these I say every runner should have. Yes. The end of the ball, so. Okay. I, got another I have two of those blue bands. I keep one in my car at all times so that I can do my activation exercises when I get out of the car because I need a band. And then I have one at home or in my bag. So yeah, I literally bring my band everywhere I go. They're like, they're like two bucks or three bucks here. So you might as well just buy a few because they're easy to lose too. <laughs> yeah. All right, I got another question queued up here. Um, and Cheryl, go ahead. Uh, this this question's for Tyson. Tyson. You've kind of told us a lot of things already, but I was just thinking if there's one thing that you think that um, all of us runners should be doing that we're probably not doing, um, what, uh, what would that be? <laughs> all right, great question. I have a little model for the answer to this question. So I got my model of the foot here. So pretty much every runner I see and even you, I can, if I can share your story as an example, when you, you kind of kept tweaking your hamstring, so your foot was locked in kind of an inverted position, or we call it supinated. So if we think about the ankle, we think about it moves this way, but real critical for runners that your foot can move back and forth like this. So into pronation, supination. And most runners, again, with the pounding of the pavement, the Tasha's injury, even Raf's injury, all the foots were jammed inward. So we want to make sure that we have good mobility. So if we look at all these bones here, there's as many joints and bones in our feet as our whole body. And so many times they just get smashed together. So um, whether you're getting on a ball, rolling the feet, having good mobility through the toes is really critical. Getting up into the calves. So there's three main calf muscles that run and attach into the foot. Um, if you want, I can write a, a note to your husband and say he needs to massage your feet more after every run. I could do that for you as well. So, um, but yeah, I find runners, yeah, need to basically roll, mobilize their feet, ankles, and also doing some strengthening of their feet. So again, glutes, hip flexors are critical, but you can have the strongest glutes in the world. But if you have this, basically this um, compressed or like a, a big rock of a foot, it needs to be dynamic and, and move. So, that's kind of the biggest things I feel runners don't give enough attention to their feet, whether it's strength and mobility. Yeah. Yeah. And that's an easy one to do. I think that like even to have just like the ball and just making sure we're taking a couple minutes every day to make sure that we're rolling it out and getting some mobility and movement in there is really important. Um, we got about two minutes left here and Lisa asked, so we'll do a quick, we'll do a quick uh, like a speed session here, but I'll get each of you to respond in like, you know, 30 seconds or less, best tips for getting faster. Tyson, let's start with you. Okay. So again, with the theme, lots of attention gets to glutes, but for people to really get faster, you want to strengthen your hip flexors because that's what's going to drive that leg forward in the running uh, motion. So um, yeah, if I do make a post, I'll, I'll go over some hip flexor strengthening as well. Because that's, that's basically how you're going to propel forward. You're going to drive that leg forward. So, yeah, I would say hip flexor strengthening is, uh, is the big key. How about you, Tash? Consistency. Um, if you can put months of training together, uh, stay healthy, um, have intervals in there twice a week, you're going to get faster. It's just the way it works. Um, if you're doing everything right and you're staying healthy and you're pushing yourself in those interval sessions, um, you get faster. Cool. I think cool. <laughs> works for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think I think you're the authority on the subject. <laughs> but consistency is key. I always say that, and and allowing your body to actually recover properly from those hard sessions. Because if you're just pounding, 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 and you're doing all these workouts, you're not gonna you're not gonna get faster. You're gonna crash. So making sure that you are respecting your body and how hard it's working and taking days off. I take a day off every week, every week. So I think that's really an important piece that a lot of runners miss is the recovery part. So cool. That's important. Blaine. Yeah, I echo that consistency. And, and for some, it takes years depending on where you're starting from mm -hmm. uh, and, and staying injury free. It's the only way you can, can keep that consistency. And then the other thing I would say as well is, is, um, is, being able to get that quick turnover like some some of us are just just don't naturally have a quick turnover so in order to be able to run fast 
you've got to train your body to run fast. And even before you can get into doing longer intervals, if you can't run efficiently. So I find like just doing shorter strides uh, and speed work really just helps your body adapt to a quicker turnover and efficient stride and running economy. And then the longer you can sort of extend that to, to do a 5k or a 10k or how, whatever it is you're training for, I think your body you've got that neuromuscular adaptation that you've, you've, you've developed by that, that quicker turnover. Cool. Well, there it is. We're at, uh, we're at 75 minutes. So thanks very much, everybody. Um, it was really, really insightful. I think this, this is a really valuable discussion. I think I speak for everybody here um, on listening in, but uh, this was super insightful. And I think that right now this is like information and sharing and everything like this uh, is so important. So, Really, really glad that you guys were able to take the time. Thank you very much. Um, and we'll be back next Monday, unless a miracle happens and we're out of this uh, physical distancing era. But we'll be back next Monday at 5 p.m. on the same Zoom line. So, guys, stay tuned for what the next um, what the next run talk is going to be. And thank you very much, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Rob. Thank Thanks.